Hello and welcome to SciShow Talk Show, that day on SciShow, where we talk to interesting people about the interesting things that they do. And today we've got Mike Potts, who is an engineer uh, working on restoring Montana to not be so poisonous anymore. It's semi-accurate, I guess. <laughs> I work for uh, Pioneer Technical Services Incorporated, a pioneer for short. Basically what we do is try and clean up messes and you know, engineer the environment to be better. <laughs> so how'd you get into this? So I had got an undergrad degree in eco-hydrology. Uh, it's basically ecology and hydrology. Uh, oftentimes you'll look at hydrology kind of from an engineering aspect where it's just how to move water from point A. You know? right. Eco-hydrology kind of looks at, okay, let's move water from point A to point B, but let's also focus on this is going to be a stream. Let's think about what kind of aquatic habitat we need, right. you know, okay. how to restore this to truly natural conditions. Awesome. Just thinking about the big picture. Mm -hmm. It's a big picture degree. So I did that. Worked with the US, US uh, Geological Survey, and we basically do science. So you study a big problem, at the end of it you produce a report and say, here's the problem, and that's the end of it. So while working at USGS, I'd, I spent a couple years working on a project, gave them the report, handed it off to the engineer, then they went and got to go design how you're going to solve fix the problem. problem. So you yeah. just identify, yeah, just identifying problems and everything about how to solve them, that's kind of a, it's kind of a bummer. Yeah, exactly, which is what led me to uh, the aha moment where I need to go become an engineer and then you can kind of see it to fruition because what's cool is you still have to study the problem to understand it to design mm -hmm. a solution mm -hmm. so the science is all there you just take it that one step further to then solve the problem so what do you uh, practically do on a day-to-day -day basis I do more groundwater modeling okay. uh, which is really fun because you don't see it you know it's some of the guys I work with call it the black magic because <laughs> You, no one ever sees what groundwater is actually doing unless you dr dr drill a well and pump it. I never really understood how intricately tied surface water and groundwater were until I went through my environmental studies degree. And there are areas where like a whole river will just disappear and then it'll come back yeah. in like 30 feet. And there's just no river in between. And it's like, what? Where did you go? We call that base flow. Um, there's a word for it. Base see, flow. there's a worse word for it. This there's is why you need a hydrology degree. <laughs> surface water is just a surficial expression of the groundwater. It's either going to be gaining, losing, or static. There's a lot that we don't see un under there. Yeah, and if that groundwater is of bad quality, then it becomes... Right, right in the surface. Yeah, bad yeah. quality surface water. So it's important to monitor groundwater and surface water and monitor those interactions. Because yeah. you can also have surface water that's impacted and then is flowing and the groundwater table's lower and you're discharging right. surface water into the groundwater and somebody drills their little well over at their house and starts drinking it. It's coming straight from the polluted river. Exactly. Yeah. So tell me a bit about the largest Superfund site in America. And first maybe explain what Superfund is. Well, Superfund is actually a program that was uh, started in the 1980s. The, basically they set aside, the government set aside money to help clean up some of the nation's most contaminated areas, you know, mining sites, nuclear sites, kind of the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So just so happens one of those sites is in our backyard between Butte and Missoula. Uh, I live in Butte, so a lot of the work I do is, it's convenient. It's right there at, at yeah. home. So. <laughs> it sometimes it feels a little bit like, uh, from an environmental perspective, we think of Butte as being a bit of a disaster. Yep. But, you know, they, Butte is an amazing part of the country because, you know, there were mountains there that are now holes. but those holes are the reason we have electricity. Like yeah. all the copper in America, like a huge amount of our copper came from that hole. We needed that to electrify this country. Butte kind of has a rough reputation. I never thought I'd live there for one. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on. I mean, there's a, a Superfund operable unit, which is a portion of the Superfund site called the Butte Priority Soils Operable Unit that encompasses the majority of the town of Butte. Oh, wow. Um, so really when you live in Butte, a lot of the residents live within an, an active Superfund site, um, which is <laughs> not ideal. Just in the time I've been there, I've seen a pretty drastic improvement. And you look at what's interesting about Butte is at the turn of the century, there was 100,000 people. It used to be this just metropolis mm -hmm. of bus, hustle and bustle. There was trolleys going up and down. There's a lot of history there. Um, but as you mentioned, the aftermath kind of leaves a mess and we're still in the process of cleaning that up for one. You mentioned there's a giant hole in the ground. <laughs> One of the big problems with that is that hole had to be dewatered. Whenever you mine underground, you're usually going to go below the water table. So you have to put in some type of well to pump the water out to kind of bring the water table down in that area um, so that you can mine. And when you dig a big pit, you have to keep the water out of that pit. 
when they stopped mining, I think it was in the early 80s, they closed down that mine, uh, water level starts to rebound. Turn off the pumps. You turn off the pumps, it starts yeah. to fill back up. And that's one of the problems is that right now all the water is flowing to that hole. When uh, that kind of stabilizes, the groundwater will then flow back out and right. it will all be very contaminated. So we have So that to, hole has not, not well, the kind of water you want to drink. The hole's not going away. There's some people right. that say you should fill it in, oh. you should do this, you should do that. <laughs> where, where are you going to get it? It's a bad there? idea. <laughs> <laughs> you basically have to keep it collecting groundwater. So the good water's flowing in there, being contaminated, then you pump that out and treat it. It seems redundant, but it's That's really the, the best only option. Way to do it. Yeah. Otherwise it just fills up and then it starts spilling back over into the water table. It becomes exactly. a part of the water table. Exactly. People then, think you they talk about the critical level in this pit. And people, I think a lot of people have this conception that it's actually going to overflow. It's oh, not going to well, overflow. It yeah. hit the water table and... And then it's in the groundwater yeah. and in the surface water. Yeah, exactly. This is all connected. Yep. That's what you learn hydrology in your hydrology 101. degree. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Missoula. Yep. There's a dam uh, in Milltown, which is just outside of Missoula. And it's, it's sort of like marked the end of contamination. So luckily that dam was built. Yeah. Um, before 1908, because in 1908, uh, a giant flood came through and up in Butte, there was a huge mine. A lot of uh, tailings had been deposited already at that point in time along uh, the stream there. That mine, the flood came through, flushed all those tailings downstream, and luckily they all got stuck behind the dam, because if the dam wasn't there, the contamination would have gone basically all the way, potentially all the way to the ocean. <laughs> Okay. So it was a very good thing. they just finished the dam too. Yeah, it was only three or four years old at the time. And it, w it withstood the flood, which was good, but it left a huge you know, mess. So what it, what, when you say tailings, what is that? So tailings, when you mine, uh, you dig up rock, crush it up, kind of process it. And usually what they'll do is mix it into a slurry that's like 80% water and then all this really fine material. It's kind of like peanut butter. It's, it doesn't know. taste like peanut butter though. I wouldn't recommend eating it, no. <laughs> but yeah, you end up with this and they just call it mine tailings. And there's different processes that leave different consistencies of it. And nowadays we have better systems for dealing with that. Well, nowadays we don't dump it back into the creek for one thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, let's put it on the side of the river. Live now. and learn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we had this dam that saved us. Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, it's not there anymore, which is not something that is easy to do to a dam. No. Basically involved dredging out the, all those sediments, or at least the majority of those you know, toxic sediments behind the dam, um, and then slowly demolishing the dam, basically. Yeah. Removing, removing that out and transporting it back up to Butte, where it came from. Did you really bring it all back to Butte? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry that you got all of Missoula's. I guess you... That's where it started, you know, so it's only <laughs> fitting it that back. it goes back. There is our tailings areas set up for that in Butte, well, around Butte. Yeah, there's a huge repository, which is basically a, a monitored, contained storage area for this type of material right. that's massive. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting, if you think about it, we still have to kind of restore the stream channel from Butte between the two areas, that's not been done yet. So the right. dam removal was actually a critical action. We had to, you know, in a perfect world, you'd start at the top and clean everything up from the top down. Right. You know, so that anything that you dig up and kind of mix up as you're, you know, excavating these things, as you mentioned earlier, water moves downhill. <laughs> but the problem is that any flood can occur at any time, blow yeah. out that dam, and then you're... You know, All the way to the ocean. <laughs> that's a terrifying thought. Like. The fact that like, like even the biggest dams that we have, like eventually, yeah. they're not going to be there anymore. It's true. And hopefully it will be because of intentional removal. Hopefully engineers <laughs> who are trained and yeah. highly educated will come in and design a plan to safely remove them and yeah. what nature will not do it for them. What's one of the most recent projects you've been working on? One of them is the, this stream restoration. This, there's a stream corridor that runs kind of between Ute and Missoula that had those mine tailings deposited. Mm -hmm. So what we did was you know, go in and excavate those tailings, redesign the stream channel. And one of the things that we do that's kind of cool is we took it a step further and then added this component called Greenway, where we design parks and walking trails to kind of provide the public access to these areas. All right, so you're getting, getting, you've got the ecology, you've got the hydrology, yep. and also you've got some civic stuff in there too. Exactly, the fi <laughs> fish are back in the stream. Um, so now we are going to meet an animal that you very well may have helped in its natural habitat. Glad to be of service. <laughs> Jesse. Hey, 
Hey. You're here. Hey. Well, it's movie magic. Woo. Uh, are you two related? Are we I believe related? so. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we are. Just, like, <laughs> this is my just cousin. first cousins. This is my cousin. Oh. Yeah. yeah. He's awesome. Thanks for setting us up. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming. It's been a pleasure. Yay. Um, what do we got? Um, just a bunch of fake plant. Fake plant. Okay. Well, this, yeah. so what's its name? It's, inorganic, inorganic. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's so. Uh, that's the first yeah. step. It's wet, yeah. so I feel like whatever we have is a wet animal. Right. Water. Water. Water <laughs> animal. And I bet you have helped one of these animals before. This is uh, a native Montana animal, actually native to a lot of the middle part of North America. Okay. Well, hi there. You're some kind of salamander. Oh, what a funny yeah. face. <laughs> Look at that little <laughs> flat, almost froggy type face. Yeah, froggy face. Mini eyes. All right, so I'm actually going to um, pick him up, but I'm going to wash my hands off first because water and oil don't mix. Yeah. Yeah. Don't want to so, clog up his pores. Yeah. Because that's how he breathes. I've got oil. He's got water. Oh, yeah. Hi there. You're wow. So... Did you already tell me what this was? This is a tiger salamander. It's weird looking. Look at his little face. <laughs> that, is a, that is a funny face. It is like a frog with a lizard body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tiger salamanders, these are like, these are super cool animals. I mean, they're one of the largest terrestrial salamanders in, in America. What is a terrestrial salamander? On land. So they don't need to be are, in water. So they're bored. Oh, so they don't. They don't live in the water. They don't live in water. They need moisture to you know survive. But actually, in their mature state, they they they're terrestrial. They live I've on land. Because I've seen the ones that live in the the streams in the south. Yeah. They're like. like okay. Okay. Well, yeah. these guys. Okay. So the the average length of the tiger salamander is like six to eight inches. Okay. Right. But they can get huge. I mean, the longest one is about thirteen inches that they found. Okay. I mean, they get big. But the thing about these guys is, so they're they are they're. Eggs are in the water, yeah. and then they can either rapidly mature within like two months, really fast, or they can take five months and more slowly mature, mm. or they just decide not to go through their metamorphosis into this adult stage here, and they stay aquatic, They'd... and they mature in their aquatic state, and those guys get like 15 inches, and they so become they sexually mature. So they can basically mature. become a different... They can stay where they are and get ginormous, or they can become terrestrial, get out of there, and stay small. Like a mudskipper? And some people call them mudskippers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, um, so, so why, I mean, why do you think they would have that <clears throat> just Well, it's not so... why. I mean, obviously there are good reasons to have yeah. like alternate paths that yeah. you might want to take if yeah. like there are different circumstances in your habitat. And exactly. more food one place than another place, but the how? Like how? Can, I know the how, how is really cool. How how could it like you know it's like it's like the the caterpillar makes its cocoon and it's like am I gonna become a butterfly or am I gonna become a bird or a big fat caterpillar? Like, which, just stay caterpillar. And yeah, gigantic. yeah. Or it's gonna become like a really or like a praying mantis. I just don't know. Who knows which one will it Woo, be? I'll never it's, find it's out a, until I hatch. That's one, really strange. Three. Yeah, yeah. That's, but but I've the never reason heard that they can do that, that adaptive thing is because. All of a sudden, their pool dries up really fast. Okay. Oh man, that's weird. They stay I love that so much. Big babies. So it's like a tadpole just either stays a tadpole and gets huge, or it becomes, or a, frog. becomes yeah. a frog. Yeah. Just it becomes a huge tadpole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there are so the other really cool thing is um, when they are competing and when they're finding the resources to go into their final adult stage, um, and they're still larvae. There are some. Um, like carnivorous larvae, where they'll go and eat the other ones of their kind, but they grow huge heads and huge mouths, Wait, and they just go around and eat all their buddies, all their <laughs> siblings, and then when they become an adult like this, then they will retain a very large head and very large mouth. So, so there's just so many, it's like, it's like so many options weird. in life. That's I was, super, I was that, super weird. You're like forever, you're labeled with your big head and mouth. I was that dude that ate my kid, my friends, yeah. my family. <gasps> and you could tell by looking at him. What? Look. Yeah, he's got a ridiculous face. I need to take a picture of that face. Wow, that's pretty. You kind of got pretty eyes. I did not realize what a <laughs> did, did, did what a looker you were. 
I think they're pretty. <laughs> you guys are being very kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're kind of they have cool colors. Spaced far apart. There's that. Yeah. But the, but the eye itself. <laughs> yeah. He looks a little yeah. dopey just if just you try to take in the whole face. Let me take just a picture of this. Face. Let me take a picture of you. A tiger salamander. You saved the life of who knows, countless tiger salamanders, which yeah. are the craziest ones. Probably animals whole. Animals. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jesse, you can learn more about uh, Animal Wonders, where she has lots of cool animals at youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana, and also uh, our new size show for kids. And, Mike. Uh, thanks for so much to, for coming and visiting with us and doing amazing work for both humans and salamanders. Well, thanks for having me. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> and thanks all of you for watching. We are SciShow, where you can see sciencey stuff at youtube.com slash SciShow.